<clears throat> Good morning, River Church. Uh, I'm excited to be here uh, with you guys. Um, if you've gone out to eat or gone to a restaurant or to a store or anything of that nature within the past year, uh, you are likely to have seen on the window or, or in, 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 in their announcement board inside or somewhere, you are likely to have seen a help wanted sign. Um, when I went to, I went to Whataburger the other day and, and Lisey's got me trained to look at uh, the receipts so you can get those free Whataburgers like at the bottom of the receipt. And so like I'm always looking for like, okay, we're going to get a, a buy one, get one free type deal. And so um, anyway, this last time I went to Whataburger, I looked at the receipt and they had a little uh, barcode at the bottom of the receipt and says, if you're interested in working for us, please scan this little code. And so everywhere, 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 it seems like help is wanted. It seems like people are, businesses are hiring. <clears throat> now, the same is true for us you know, as Christians. I feel like Jesus looks at us, and this is, I feel like Jesus looks at us with a help wanted sign, uh, holding a help wanted sign as he looks at us. In the passage that we're going to look at today, it's in Matthew chapter 9, and it's this idea that, that Jesus is calling for more workers. He is calling, he, it's, it's almost like he has that help wanted sign at the bottom of the receipt, right? Help wanted. He is calling for more workers. There's, there's work for us as Christians to do. Now, now the problem, and I'm guilty of this too, the problem is that we don't necessarily want to help. We, we, we aren't interested in helping. If it, if it were a restaurant, we're, we're more interested of just ignoring the sign, going in, getting our food, and g leaving a tip, and getting out. We're, we're not interested in the work. Now, the, the, what we're going we're gonna to look at today, we're going to talk about today, is, is the work that Christ is calling us to. It, it's not like this, this optional thing. It's something that all of us as Christians, myself included, we are all called to be a, a part of the work that Christ is calling us to. It's, it's, a, it's a mandatory one. Now, if you are here a few weeks ago, I preached uh, on evangelism, and it's that, that same thing we're, we're going to discuss today. The, the work that Christ called us to uh, is to evangelize, is to go out with our faith. <clears throat> And today we're going to look at it. So, 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 so today's passage, um, uh, the, the Lord is saying that the, 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 the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few, the workers are few. And so today's sermon, as we go through it, we're going to look at it kind of like a job description. Okay? So a job description, um, who's our leader, uh, what's our message, what's our motivation, and, and, and what, are, what is our mission, what are we, what are we to do? Okay, so as Christ is calling us to be workers, it's helpful to know uh, what the work is, right? <clears throat> and so today we're going to be looking at a story from the Gospel of Matthew. Now, Matthew is one of the four Gospels, and, and so there's four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and each one of these Gospels is like a painting of Jesus, a, a, a portrait of Jesus, and you have these four writers, and each one of these Gospels has their own way of viewing Jesus. Not that they contradict each other, but they are written for a purpose. And in Matthew, Matthew's big uh, push, Matthew's, one of his big themes is that Jesus is the promised king. Right? The Israelites were looking for this promised king, and, and the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, is presenting Jesus as this king. If you look at just if you look at the, the uh, this uh, this book, it starts with the genealogies, right? It starts at the beginning. It, it starts with uh, uh, the whole genealogies leading up to Christ, right? And the idea there is that it's that it's saying that hey, this this Jesus that we're talking about, he's part of this this bloodline that we have been talking about, right? This this promised 
Savior that is to come. He is part of that lineage. And then if you look at the end of Matthew, Matthew 28, Jesus says, all authority has been given to me, right? The Great Commission, go therefore and make disciples. And so in that, you see all authority has been given to me, basically saying I am the king, right? I am allowed or I have the right to say what I want to say because I am the king. Those are the two bookends that accurately depict what Matthew uh, is trying to do. And that's, again, that's to paint Jesus as our king. Now, with any king, there's a kingdom. And with any kingdom, there are people. And so we are, as Christians, we are those people in that kingdom worshiping that king. Now, as, as people in this kingdom, we are called to work. We are called to engage in his work. We are called to do his work. Now, by the end of our time today, <clears throat> I want us to be moved, deeply moved, to engage in the work that Christ has called us to do. I, I, I don't want us to ignore the help wanted sign. I want us to engage in the work. Now our passage today uh, is calling for workers. And as I, as I just said, workers are meant to, to as Christian, Christian workers, we are meant to, to share the news of the gospel. We're meant to try and uh, tell other people, like, hey, there's a kingdom here. There's a king. You should come with us into this kingdom. Or you've heard the phrase in, in, uh, in Paul's letters, you've heard the phrase of being an ambassador, right? We are ambassadors for Christ. It's the same concept. It's the same concept. Um, Ambassadors speak on behalf of the king. Uh, this is the same issue here, except Jesus decided to use uh, the phrase workers instead of ambassadors. But, but the idea and the message is the same. And, and that is we are inviting people into relationship with Jesus. That is our work. <clears throat> Now, I've framed, as I said earlier, I framed today's sermon. So, as we are going to be workers, I framed today's sermon through uh, kind of like a job description. So, as we read the passage, we'll kind of break it down to see exactly what it is that we are uh, to be getting into. But as a worker, we'll first see that we have a leader that we are to follow, which is Jesus. We will then see what message we are to proclaim which is the gospel. Then we'll see the attitude we are to have. Right? You go to Chick-fil-A, they all have like a cheerful, happy attitude, right? Uh, everything always seems like it's just great. Okay? As Christians, we, we, we have uh, an attitude that we are uh, to partake of. And then the last thing is our responsibilities in, this, uh, in, in response to this message. Now with that, let's look at Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 to 38. It says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. First thing I want us to see is we have a leader. We have a, a king, and that is Jesus. He is our example. Now, if you just stop and think, this is crazy. The king who is 
calling us to this work, if we read this passage and we read uh, what's leading up to this passage, the king that calls us to this work is actually doing this work also. He is engaged in this work. All that Jesus asks us to do is stuff that he is, has already done. And, and you can tease this all the way out to right, sacrificing yourself for another person. But in this passage, in calling to go out and calling to be a worker, we see that we have a leader who's already done the work. He is doing the work. Now in this, in Matthew, this is, I I just geeked out about this, you may not find it interesting, but Matthew's Matthew's broken up into five parts, right? There's there's five different sections, and and this idea is that uh, the Gospel of Matthew is talking about the king and his kingdom in this first section, uh, this first section that we, that that this passage is, is found in the first section, and this first section is Jesus going out and declaring uh, that he is the king, right? Repent and believe is, is how he starts uh, this, this section of Matthew. It starts in chapter 4. It reads, Jesus went throughout uh, Galilee teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. So you see that in Matthew chapter 4. That's the same message we see in Matthew chapter 9. And so everything in between these two chapters, these two verses, is proclaiming, uh, is Jesus saying that the, the kingdom of God has, is here. And so, and, so, and so we start to see uh, what that looks like. And so, and so what, what does this consist of in this section? Well, we see Jesus doing a lot of teaching. It has the Sermon on the Mount. It has various... Uh, times that Jesus was instructing people on how to live, and basically what it was is, hey, this is what life in the kingdom should look like, right? And then he, 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 he also, in this first section, he also heals a ton of people. He's healing the sick. He is, he is healing people. He is making the lame walk. He is doing those things, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later uh, but that's what's happening in this first section. Now, as a leader, um, I have been, well, as a leader, when you look at a leader, uh, <clears throat> whenever uh, someone asked you, a leader asked you to do something, and they're not willing to do what they're asking you to do, kind of lose credibility, right? Lose uh, any confidence that, that someone might have in, in you. Now, I am a huge fan of, uh, well, I was uh, a huge fan of Urban Meyer, right? Urban Meyer was the head football coach at Ohio State. Um, he was also at Florida with, with Tim Tebow back in the day. He, he's been a very successful college coach. And me and Randy have talked about him. I was like, man, Randy, uh, he was wearing these cool Nike pants and like this cool Nike shirt. I want to dress like that guy. We had that conversation like a year ago. Um, and so I was like, man, this guy's awesome. So I bought his book. It's, it's, a, it's above the line. It's a really good book. I was actually talking to a buddy of mine who's a coach, a tennis coach in Harlingen. And, and he gets all geeked out about Urban Meyer also. He's like, man, that guy's awesome. What book was it? He, he got the book. He started sharing the book with his players. He's like, okay, these are the principles that we're going to be going by uh, as, as we develop our, our tennis team. Right? And, then, and then this year, if you, if you don't follow him, this year he got hired as a head coach in the NFL for the Jacksonville Jaguars. And everybody thought, man, he got the first round pick. He got Trevor Lawrence, uh, who is like a one, one, once in a lifetime or in a, ge- a generational talent, right? And so he, everybody thought, man, it's going to happen. He's going to turn that program, program around just like he did Ohio State, just like he did Florida, just like he did every other school that he was at, right? And about three or four weeks in, a few months into the job, like all this scandal broke out with Urban Meyer. Right? He was, uh, he, instead, of, instead of traveling with the team, he was staying back. He was going out, partying. He was putting himself in compromising situations. And it was just, man, for me, it was very disheartening. I was like, wow, this guy. 
Right, all these things that he was talking about in his book, all these, 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 these ways that he was encouraging his players to behave, uh, pushing them towards right, having this above-the-line behavior. And you see from him that he was living in a way that was not meeting that standard. Now, <clears throat> what that does to his leadership, it just, he loses all credibility. You don't want to listen to him anymore. You don't want to follow him because he's not doing what he's asking others to do. And we don't, we don't have that with Jesus. Jesus is doing what he asks us to do. Jesus, as our king, he, he's not one to sit back and, and order everyone else around but our king showed us how to do it. Jesus is our leader. The next thing I want us to see is, uh, so, we, so we looked at who our leader is. The next thing I want us to look at is what our message is, and that is the gospel. Verse 35 says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease. In Matthew 4, he says, uh, From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is, at near, is near. Right? Turn from your ways. The kingdom of heaven is here. Right? The kingdom of God is here. And the, the beautiful thing about this, and this is our message, the beautiful thing about that is that we can participate uh, with Jesus in his kingdom. As Christians, Ephesians 2, 6 says, As God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So right now, I refer to this passage a lot, but right now we are uh, in relationship with Jesus and <clears throat> in some mysterious way we are with him as he is seated in the heavenly places. We are seated with him right now. And it's, the cool thing is, is, is this is what eventually it's going to look like perfectly. Right? If we look at Revelation chapter 21, we see it says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. And he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the older things have passed away. This is what is to come. And as we look at this passage in Revelation, there are a lot of parallels to what we see in Matthew chapter 9, right? Jesus is among these people. He is with these people. He is healing people's diseases, right? He is teaching them. We see a glimpse of that in Matthew. One day, that's how it's going to be always, and that's amazing. <laughs> what a beautiful message. But Jesus is starting to do that now. We are invited into this kingdom, into relationship with Jesus now. However, those who choose to remain in their sin cannot be part of this kingdom. It's difficult to enter into this kingdom, not because it's, not because it's hard, we believe in Jesus for the work that he has done. It's not, it's not because it's hard. It's because we don't want to turn from our ways. We tend to love the darkness more than the light. More than the light. But the gospel is the news, and this is our message. The gospel is the news that there is freedom from slavery to sin. Right? The, the people in our passage today, they are slaves to sin. You before Christ 
were a slave to sin. And if we, we, and if we repent and we turn to God, then, then he will receive us. Our sins separated from God. Our sins separated us from God. Jesus' work reconciles us. We must turn from our ways and trust in Jesus. And, and maybe you've struggled with that. Maybe you've tried to hold on to, 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 to your old ways. Maybe you're not a Christian and you're like, man, this Christian stuff, it sounds cool, but this other stuff is, 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 is much better. And so you stay there, but, but, but over time you realize, like, man, this, this isn't working for me. This, the, the way that I have chosen to, 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 to live my life, the things that I am doing, the sin that I am engaged in is tearing me down. If that's you, I invite you to respond to the call of Jesus in your life. Right? Jesus looks at you and says, I know you got all that stuff. Come to me. I will take care of it. I got you. Come to me. Come to me. That is our message. And again, if, if, if you're in here and you haven't, and you haven't thought about that, you haven't, you've, you've kind of been resisting Jesus, I'd invite you just to, to respond to the call in your life. <clears throat> we have a leader we have a message. Now we're going to look at our attitude. And our attitude should be a compassion for the lost. In verse 36, it says, When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Our attitude is that we should have a deep compassion for the lost. It should bother us deeply. In, verse, uh, in, verse, in this verse, it says that Jesus had compassion for him. Now, in English, you know, compassion, okay, like I feel bad for that situation. It kind of bothers me a little bit. But in the original Greek, and I, I, can't, I can't pronounce the word, but the original Greek, this word that was used for compassion, is this, is the, it, 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 it means this, this, it's the deepest sense of compassion, He, Jesus was moved to his core with compassion. Again, it's not a mental ascent of a bad situation and just kind of carrying on with your life, but it's the kind of compassion that shakes you, that tears you apart. You, you feel extremely burdened with compassion for the lost. Jesus had that compassion for the lost, for people who did not know him. Why did he have this compassion? Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So, so what is a shepherd, right? A shepherd, in this illustration Jesus uses, a shepherd is someone who takes care of his sheep, right? His, his life is about his sheep. He, he takes care of them. He feeds them. He makes sure they are fed. He, um, he prevents them uh, from getting attacked, right? He protects them. Uh, he prevents them from wandering off, right? From like falling off a cliff. <laughs> he protects them. The life of a shepherd is focused on the goodness and the well-being of his sheep. Now, without a shepherd, it doesn't look good for the sheep. It's like with, if you've ever been around, so I coached a t-ball team. Man, and if you're not like on top of the t-ball team, you have like kids climbing the fence, and then another kid like banging the, his, his bat on someone else's helmet. Like it's crazy, 
right? Kids are throwing t-balls at each other. It's just, it's not just George was there. We, we, wherever George is, George, we coached a t-ball this year. It was crazy. It was fun, but you have to be on them or else it's like, it's like, man, it's like trying to herd cats. It's just nuts, right? <clears throat> it's not good for the sheep. It wasn't good for the kids. The, the words, if there weren't coaches, it's not good for the sheep without having a shepherd. Now, the audience, again, we're reading from the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew, his audience was uh, a Jewish audience. Now, that's significant. His audience was a Jewish audience. And so of all the people, these Jewish people should be uh, uh, instructed correctly. They should uh, know, okay, th- th- this is what the Old Testament has said, and we should be looking for this coming Messiah. They should be protected. They should be cared for. Um, they should uh, be taken care of. But that was not the case with these people. They were lost, and they were harassed, and they were taken advantage of, and they were helpless. And this moved Jesus to the core. Now my question is, do we have this compassion for the lost? Do we have a deep compassion for those who don't know Jesus? Now, these people, right, right, unchristians, non-Christians, they are all around us. We can see, I mean, we see many people all over TV, all over social media, uh, who, who, who don't value Jesus, right, who, who, who their, their values and their priorities and their lifestyles are completely in opposition to what Jesus teaches and, 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 and in opposition to who Jesus calls us to be. And many of these people, they outright oppose Jesus. Do we have compassion for them? What is our attitude towards these people? Right? Jesus looks at, and I just, I just imagine Jesus looking at our world, and of course being, being angry at the sin, but, but I'm also sure that he is moved with compassion for the people. Right? John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his Son. Romans, Romans 6, 8, or 5, 8 says, uh, Christ demonstrated his love for us in this way. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us, moved with compassion for us, moved with compassion for the people who are wandering like sheep without a shepherd. Now, as as followers of Christians, and I'm guilty of this, as followers of Christians, it's easy to kind of sit on our moral high horse, right? And, And look down on the rest of the world And to be angry at the brokenness, but not compassionate for them. Let's not forget that before Christ called us, that was was us. We were those people. We were lost. We were like sheep without a shepherd. Let us be a people of deep compassion for the lost. Moving on, the last thing to look at is our responsibility. Verse 37 and 38 says, uh, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. 38. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus said to his disciples that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers, the workers, are few. That means that that there are many people who are waiting 
to respond to uh, to, to the gospel, there are many people who are looking and waiting to hear the message of the king. There are many people who are confused and lost and hurt who are waiting to come to Christ. The harvest is plentiful. That's not the issue that Jesus is saying. The issue is saying, the, the issue is that Jesus is saying that there are no workers. So what does he want us to do? Two things. One of them is found in this passage. The next one is found like in the very next paragraph. Um, but the first thing is we are to pray for workers. We are to pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out people. Let us be a people who is praying for more workers. Let us let us pray for a people, uh, let's pray for people who are going out and evangelizing, going out and sharing their faith with others. Let's pray that the Lord raise people up and send them out to share the gospel. Let's pray for new missionaries. Let's pray for our missionaries. We have four missionaries who are all around the world Let's pray for them that as they go out, uh, they do the work that Christ is calling us to do. Let's pray for them. Let's pray for uh, in Los Fresnos. I don't know if well, some of y'all may know this, but there is a, a missionary training agency in Los Fresnos who they, uh, what they do is they train people up to send them to the mission field. And I have some buddies over there and they're constantly getting in new missionaries. Let's pray for to every tribe. Let's pray for their leaders. Let's pray for their applicants, their, their trainees as they are trained up and sent out. Let us pray for people to share their faith with their neighbors. Let us pray for people to share their faith with their friends and with their co-workers. Let us, let us pray for those things. Now, if, when you read this passage, and, and I, I think this is right, we should be praying that the Lord raises people up and sends them out. But the second part to this is that we are to be the workers as we saw here in this passage, Jesus calls us to pray, but in the very next sentence, the next five verses in chapter 10, right, <clears throat> Jesus, he says, okay, you guys prayed? Okay, now disciples, come here, and disciples, the, the guys who just prayed, okay, you're done praying? Come with me, I'm going to send you guys out. Jesus calls his disciples, the people that he just told to pray, he calls them, and he sends them out. We are to be the workers. We have freely received Christ, and we should freely share Christ with others. And I know that this is hard, and we talked about this a few weeks ago uh, in, our, in our sermon about evangelism, um, where we looked at the life of Peter in, in Acts chapter 4, and he prays for boldness, right? He was just persecuted. He was just standing before these rulers, right? And, and, and everybody, myself included, would have been like, okay, I got to lay low for a little bit. I can't go out there with my faith. I can't be um, um, bold about my faith. I need to, to chill out for a little bit. And what, is the, uh, what does Peter do? He prays to the Holy Spirit for boldness that he may continue to, to present the gospel in the face of whatever may come. Let that be us. If you're, if you're worried about um, how it may go over, if you're scared of something, again, I preached this a few weeks ago, but the big idea is, man, pray to the Holy Spirit for power. Pray to the Holy Spirit for boldness. You can't just muster up, I'm just going to try a little bit harder. It's not going to work. It doesn't work. Pray to the Holy Spirit for boldness, for courage to go. That's where our hope is, guys. Every application, every application we talk about, any sermon we preach, the, the application, the strength comes from the Holy Spirit and is true today as well. Now... <clears throat> 
again, we preached on this a few weeks ago, so I'm not going to give you that same application. But I do want to leave us with a strategy or a thought in regards to evangelism. And, it's, and, and, and that thought is this. Don't say no for someone. Don't say no to the gospel for someone else. We are called to be the workers. We are called to have compassion and to share the gospel with people. Right, let's not say no for them by not sharing the gospel with them. And what I mean by that... And I've been there. I'm sure we've all been there. What I mean by that is, man, I'm going to share the, you know, you may think I'm going to share the gospel with this person, right? Pastor really told me this week I need to share the gospel, but, and I want to share with this one coworker of mine, but that dude's, man, that dude's whack. <laughs> that dude, there's no way that guy is going to believe in Jesus. You're going to think he's going to laugh at me. He's going to rush me out of here. He's going to make fun of me. Everybody's going to make fun of me at work. It's just going to be bad, right? That is the temptation. And what, what happens when we think that way is we say no for them. We don't allow them the opportunity to respond to the good news of the gospel. We say, man, I'm just going to say no for you, save myself this time, and, and, and go ask someone else who I think is a better candidate. Don't say no for someone else. We need to give them the opportunity to respond to Jesus. <clears throat> In closing, Christ calls us to be his workers. He is our leader. He gives us our message, the gospel. He shows us our attitude, his deep compassion, Right? And he tells us what our responsibility is, is to pray and to go. I pray that we, um, <clears throat> as we see this and as we are challenged to go, I pray that our hope uh, is found in the Holy Spirit. As you can see, there is a shortage of workers. Help is wanted. Work is needed to be done but no one wants to do the work. Let us not ignore the help wanted sign. But let us do the work that Christ is calling us to. The harvest is plentiful. Let us be the workers of the harvest. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for calling us, for being our leader uh, in this front, in this work that you have called us to do in spreading uh, your name and your fame throughout the world, Lord. Thank you for just including us to be uh, a, a part of that work, Lord. Holy Spirit, I pray that as we were encouraged this morning, convicted, um, um, challenge, Lord. I pray that, that we don't rely on our own ability to do what you are calling us to do, Lord, but I, I, I pray that we rely on the strength and the power that comes from you, Holy Spirit. Empower us. Give us the strength, the boldness to do the work that you have called us to do. Lord, I pray that as we go uh, through this week, Lord, I pray that, that we pray that, that you raise up other people, but I also pray, Lord, that you raise us up and you send us out. Let us not be a people who are, are the judge, who, who, who say no, who, who determine whether someone is fit or not to hear the gospel. Let us, let us do the work that you have called us to. The, the harvest is plentiful, Lord. I pray that, that you give us the, the strength and the boldness to go into that harvest. Pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.